And good morning to everybody. Thank you for Steve and Craig and Bob inviting me. As some of you have joked before, and it seems like I've spent the last week talking at Offshore Europe and on various panels, and I must admit, if it had been on any other subject, I'd have declined or delegated to Bob. But you can't delegate this subject. You can't abrogate it. You can't walk away. You can't duck safety leadership. So... Uh, I'm going to talk about my own thoughts, what I do. Last time Steve encouraged me to talk was Safety 30 Conference, which some of you may remember. Uh, Chris had been harassing us all about hydrocarbon releases. I walked around the exhibition with a bunch of my safety reps and generally got a bit fired up. Went to chair the first session. Mr Wheelhouse did one of his very thrilling uh, pieces and then I was on. And before I knew it, I was headlines in the P&J. Uh, and that was when I talked about sharing lessons and how we'd forgotten how important that was and how the lawyers sometimes got in the way and they were internal or external lawyers. And like some other industries, we had to find a way to get around those problems, around those, around those barriers. And there I was, Nulsi Boss says lawyer, tells lawyers to get lost, was before I'd even left the stage, that was the online headline at the P&J. I had a couple of members of my board harass me as they were getting up at six o'clock in the morning from the US. I had a couple of lawyers, uh, indignant. But most importantly, I had all of my safety reps, I had Chris and a few other people actually pleased that I'd said it. And I reckon I had eight or 10 safety reps from other companies get in touch and say thank you. And for me, in that, little, in that little way and uh, getting into a bit of hassle back in my own shop with the lawyers, it was all worth it. And that is in part what we all as leaders have to do. We have to go out and we have to do what's right. Chris went through a list of why we should. I'd just add to that list, we should because it's right. Because that's the way we were all brought up. That's the way we'd like our kids to look at us and think about us, and that's the way we'd like our peers to, to look, about, look at us. So I'm never normally nervous, but I'm more queasy and have more trepidation talk, standing up and talking about this topic th than anything else. So I'm going to try and describe what, what I feel is really important as a leader and director and major and has a business. Every day we try and get better, I try and get better. Chris Roy is not the finished article by, it, by any measure. We've come a long way in a couple of years. We had some comments on our flange management a, two, a, year, a year odd ago and made a big difference to how we looked at our TAR program this year, how we came out and the confidence we had that everything was going to be fine and, and, and it was. But we've had to learn a few. We're as good as tomorrow, we say internally. I think we should all remember that. Cock of the walk, one week, feather dust to the next. So it's in that context that I'll talk. There's some great guidance from the HSC. There's a couple of little booklets. There's guidance for leadership and there's guidance for leadership in major accident hazard industries. They're not long books, 10 or 12 pages. I promise if you read them tonight over a cup of tea, you will remind yourself about something that you've perhaps forgotten or that's stuck in the shadows of how you do your work. So I'd really encourage you to have a, have a look. I've cribbed from it mercilessly. Uh, mercilessly. I've had plenty of years in operations, but as I've just been told, I'm a chartered accountant, so I'm not a process engineer. But with the leadership piece, I think I can do. Right, I'll start again with the law. Uh, the law places duties on organisation and, and employers. You know, directors can be personally liable if they're careless or they breach those duties. Now, whether they want it or not, non-exec directors, exec directors, everybody has a joint and legal, joint legal individual uh, responsibility. Now, I've gone and actually explained that to my kids, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but I've actually sat down and explained why it's important what dad does and what difference I can make. And that's all part of why I'll go offshore and why I spend a lot of time talking to me. And actually, over and above that responsibility, the guilt I would feel talking to them and talking to my friends, my family, my dad, would be impossible to bear. So I will add that 
to the list of why this is a good thing. Having to talk to somebody's family about an incident that I could have made a difference would, would be almost impossible. We have a little test in our shop. We, we have, we're not very clever, so we have really simple, simple tests, simple words, and we have our to be proud of test that has uh, been going down well on uh, Ruby Slaw Hill as well at the moment. And if your family can be proud of what you're doing, if you could talk openly about what you're doing at work, and that could be a toolbox test, it could be writing a permit to work, it could be an ORA, it could be some engineering work, but if you're proud of that and can discuss it openly, it's the right thing. If you feel a little bit reluctant, a little bit un unhappy, or you're cutting a corner, it's the wrong thing, and you can apply that right across the piece, including our individual roles as leaders. So perhaps, perhaps remember that. Um, in our shop at Crystal, people know that I am the controlling mind, which is, a, which is uh, sometimes a very low bar, but I am the controlling mind. I'm the personal, person ultimately responsible where the book stops. People are allowed to stop me in the corridor. They're allowed to stop me in the street. I often get stopped in, in Union Street. They can tell me I'm wrong. They can tell me what's wrong or something that they're uncomfortable with, what they wish to change. I can ask you all, do you know who your controlling mind is? who's in charge, who actually takes responsibility and where, and where the book stops, who's responsible for safety performance, who's leading the effort. Are they here? Are they accessible? I've had one country MD apologise to me for not being able to be here today, but I found the time. Are your leaders actually putting the effort in? And if not, go and tell them. Is your, does your organisation understand or is it some faceless leader over the, over the pond, in which case you need to do something about it? Senior management commitment is absolutely vital to effective health and safety performance. I think I cribbed that directly from one of the booklets. Steve's, you, Chris has used some of the similar words. Everybody knows if you're not genuine or you're paying lip service. People are not stupid. It's easy to patronise people. They know when you're lying, when your heart's not in it. And that can't be, that can't be right, because that'll make things even worse. Almost better not to, not to say anything than to, than to pretend. Process is important, it's necessary, but really successful safety management, I would say it's only achieved with personal commitment and clear leadership. Through the chain of command, it's not just one person. There might be one person who carries the book, but it's all the way through, through asset managers, through IMs, through supers everybody who can make a difference, and then down to individual techs, everybody offshore who should be looking after each other, who have a responsibility to look after their colleagues for themselves, but also for the families, and that's right across the piece. The safety culture within an organisation, Chris has already said, it is absolutely top of the list, and as leaders we can make most of, it, most of a difference there. It should be the bigger part of a leader's job, is the culture and primarily the safety culture. I unequivocally spend more time, Bob, I think, on safety, operational integrity, maintenance, than I do on the financial performance of the company. I wonder how many other MDs and, and CEOs do, 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 do the same. We talk about major accident hazard and prevention of major accidents all the time. And, and my, my colleagues who are going to join us from Conoco will hear all the time we talk about major accident hazard. Trying to strike a balance between how we prioritise occupational safety versus process safety is really, really critical. Um, and I often over-exaggerate. So I don't like people slip and trip. I don't like people hammering the thumb. But the total loss of a platform, killing lots of people really quickly, that is what is unbelievably important in this industry. That is what we're about preventing. And people forget that. Sometimes it, 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 it di we divert from what is really, really important. And that's just without even getting into destroying your company, the lives that, that are lost, the, fa the, the families, the people who are, in, who are implicated. A coffee cup lids, really that important. The handrail signs, that important. Yeah, it's all part of the picture. But we have ordinary cups. You put a little lid on if you want. As long as you don't throw your coffee at somebody, as long as you don't pour it over your computer, that's, I don't really care. You don't throw it at your kids. What I really care about is you know that top of the list for Phil is process safety from major accident prevention. 
it isn't spilling coffee on the, on the tiles. We can get another one for a fiver and it keeps one of the handymen in a job. That's not really important. Major accident hazard prevention is really what's important. We as leaders have got to keep our people's horizons clear. We've got to keep explaining what's the priority and what they should be focused on. Um, we all have roles. Know your role. Does anybody know the, uh, uh, the pun? Who's been showing the major accident hazard series of videos that Step Change put together in their organisation? Not sure. Maybe there have been. There's a little, little, little link in there. Maybe you've publicised them. We've gone out of our way, and it's part of showing it's important to try and cover everybody in the in the organisation. And I reckon we've done at least 95%, or, or I think we have. We've really tried, and not by sending a link or posting onto Tinterweb and saying, "Have a look at this," but a leader, a manager, sitting down with each person in small groups, onshore and offshore and talking through those videos and what major accident hazard prevention is all about, talking about bow ties, talking about barriers. And I have done all of the sessions in London for each one of the videos, not because I'm very good, I'm probably nowhere near as good as Bob or Mark or some of my HSE individuals, but I've stood up, led the sessions, asked the questions, so everybody on shore knows it's important to me. And I've gone out of my way to try and help people learn. And if I didn't understand something, I found out and I can talk, I can talk about it. And people then know that that is part of our, my role. But also, I can ask them, do they know their role? Do the people on shore, do people in accounts payable know why it's actually important to place suppliers on time? Why people in CMP, it's really important to spec the equipment right? Why management and change is fundamental, fundamental to, to, what, to what we do. And keep having and finding excuses for process safety conversations is something we try and do, we try and do all of the time. Now, yes, you've got process, plant, and, and, and people, but trying to find opportunities to talk, broadening the conversations and getting, getting more people involved is, is part of the job, knowing that's in the lexicon and in the conversations that go going on in your business. And then people begin to get confident about talking, about beginning to put their hand up and say something that isn't quite right, something that something needs doing. But only when they're confident and they know the CEO and the management and the team can, are happy to talk about it. It should be, process safety should be part of everybody's daily work. It should be something that's in the forefront or somewhere in the mid of people's mind. And that's whether it's toolbox talks, life-saving rules, controller work mechanisms, whatever. Our CFO, small Welshman with a poor sense of humour, regularly, go, regularly goes offshore and, and overnight, and he quite likes it. He can have two breakfasts, he can talk to multiple shifts and eat, and eat, and eat a lot. But he will talk about process safety. He will talk about major accident hazard prevention in the canteen, in the, in the tea, shop, tea shack, and he's a 30-year investment banker. And people know that's important to the company. And it is by little acts of theatre, by little acts of demonstrating what is really, really important that the organisation knows this is real. It's not, it's not lip service. It's, it's a real commitment. My team is clear on the expectations when it comes to safety. I expect people to talk. I expect them to keep talking, to be open, to understand what's going on, to be guiding and chaperoning, sometimes being as tough as, tough as needs. But they need to understand and cascade through our expectation. Uh, we demonstrate all the time people are important, that people going home at the end of a trip is really important. But... You've got to empower an open culture, else you're not going to hear the you're not going to hear the messages. You know, we, people have to have the ability to stop and halt a job. We had a, we've had a couple of really good examples recently. One actually, when one of Chris's off, uh, inspectors was offshore doing a tour with one of the techs, spots a small weep that the guy had not seen before. Radios in the control room, shuts it, shuts in shuts in the well that part of plant. Not even doesn't even consult the OIM. Would that happen on all of your platforms? And it wasn't just because there was an inspector. It, 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 it happened. The inspector, I think, was a bit shocked that he could do it on off his own back. But do your guys know? Do your women know that they've got that authority? Prediction doesn't really matter. 
it's not all about money. It's about people going home safe at night and knowing what's knowing what's knowing what's important. I think that's I think that's fantastic, and uh, saved me having to say that month yet again that people could stop stop the job. We have to walk the talk, and people have to know it's true, and we're not just generating generating dollars. You know, I still thought about Piper. That was th 31 years ago. Chris has said we've still got lots of pro process containment incidents. It would be very easy. It would be very easy to repeat such an event. What are we all doing internally to keep alive the lessons of Piper Alpha? When was the last time you flicked through the recommendations? There's some great ones in there. And it's worth a, it's worth a read. I think as from last year, you can re-get the report. It used to be out of print, but you can buy it, and it's available. I'd it, I'd suggest it's worth flick it's worth flicking through. How in an organisation can we make sure young people who are joining us learn those lessons and have the same level of awareness? We've committed to take everybody to Spade Adam, which the industry used to do regularly. Show the power of nature and what can go wrong and how quickly. It, it can go wrong. It costs a lot of money, but again, people know that it's important to our company. And we'll do the same with all our new colleagues who are, who are joining, uh, joining from, from Conoco. Because we're not an ordinary business. You know, we're, we're not running a factory. We're not running a shop. It's a major accident hazard with hydrocarbons that blow up and kill, th kill people really, really, really quickly. Um, systems and reporting are fantastically important. We have, we have a scorecard which everybody's bonus is set on. So we do quite a large amount of individual bonuses through the year, little spot, little spot awards, relatively high percentage of the payroll. But everybody in the company, including me, is rewarded on the same scorecard, and there is not an individual bonus multiplier. It, your percentage is paid on your, on, on your level of seniority. Uh, we have safety performance. Um, we have incident frequency. We, we have uh, safety critical maintenance backlog. We have total maintenance backlog. We have POM ones. We have around about 30% of the card is environmental and health and safety stats. We inherited quite a big maintenance backlog when we acquired the platforms. And we, over two years, have put that well under a third, around about 25%, which we're, about, we're, at, we're roughly happy with as a good level to roll over. But that is visible for everybody to see every month and forces me and my managers to have, to have those conversations. You know, we have to share the good and the bad news. We have to say, this is not right. This doesn't look good. This is creeping. And the asset managers have to f shuffle the feet and feel a bit bad in front of everybody else. We have, to ha we, have to have those, we have to have those conversations. If they see we're focused on it, things will change. Things will improve. And that continual improvement is, is what's really important. But you have to keep things simple. You know, Chris talked about Longford and safety management systems. The number of BMS and systems I've seen where you couldn't read it. You know, th this is human factors at its most simplest. If you want people to do things and there is a separacy, you've got to write it in a way that an ordinary person can, can read it, understand it and follow it. Else they're going to do something else. We all know the tendency is to go and get a hammer, not read the rule book. We have to find a way to make sure they read the rule book before they go and get the hammer. Okay, um, we have very, we spend a lot of time tr talking to people, which I've already said. We have very simple performance stats. We have HSE barometers, which uh, were originally tasked as if you were asked in the pub, how are we doing? How would you explain it? And we use those to try and sit down, OAM, supers offshore, go through with the staff, and they can easily see a whole range of metrics. And we use the same thing onshore. They're on the walls. They're not perfect, but they're not meant to be perfect. They're meant to be ha about having the conversation. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's about demonstrating the journey and that you're recording and that you're measuring, and it's really important and trying, trying, to, get, trying to get better. Uh, we don't cover people in barrel loads of paper and booklets. It's got to be, got to be simple. Um, people know we care. We have changed our rotors. We are changing the rotors of our, the people who are joining us from, from Conoco. We know, people know it is important and that the front line are the offshore techs. Now, that doesn't have to apply to any company. You can wear whatever rotor you want, but these 
the guys and girls offshore have got to know they are the most un important part, part of the business. Um, we, have, we have quarterly reviews, safety rep, for, rep forums, offshore visit. Uh, I regularly go to the heliport, heaven forbid, at stupid o'clock in the morning. My HSEQ director, Mark, goes every week and picks a crew change flight, and if I can fit it in, I'll go. I'm not as good as him, but he goes every week. He goes for 20 minutes, that's about the limit, any more senior management time than 20 minutes uh, as they're waiting to go offshore and they begin to get pissed off. But they know it's important, let alone when I turn up in my suit. I think they're roughly 15 minutes is probably as much intensity as they, as, as they can cope with, especially when I've had two or three cups of coffee. But we'll grab the safety reps, we'll talk with the whole, all the people, even the ones who are hidden upstairs who don't really want to, want to talk to them. We'll go and find out what they're thinking, what's important, what they've just done, what they've just done in the, in the, in the break, time, break time. We have little sessions in the morning, we have town halls, none of which per is perfect, but every opportunity we'll talk about major accident and hazard, and I will probably make my coffee cup lid joke just to remind him what's, re what's really important. Um, safety reps, the ones who got me in trouble at Safety 30 Conference, I cannot speak more highly of. Uh, we've, it is such a great way of involving your workforce. Uh, you can tell I'd be more used to Wheel Tappers and Shunters Club than the Reform Club on Pall Mall. But being close to the people who are actually doing the work is, is fundamental if you want them, if you want them to understand and look after each other. They meet with me regularly. We have regular meetings. I present, they present at me. We invite Chris as HSE inspectors. We have the metaphorical sa sandwiches and we talk about what's, imp what, uh, what's important. And I always prioritise the safety reps when we, when, when, we get, when we go offshore. Massively important. I don't know whether they're as encouraged in every organisation. We hear lots of stories that they're not valued. We have elections now. Heaven forbid. On all the platforms, they've never had an election. Now if we have a safety rep drops out or retires, I have a number of people who want to fill those roles. Is that the same in your organisation? And if not, why not? I guess they can't be bothered, or they don't think it's important, which is which which is a, which is a, ter a, a terrible sign. One of my people ask about what I've been proud of over over the years, and one of my most um, proud incidents: uh, the day we announced the Conoco deal, I was walking down Union Street, and a couple of my uh, Geordie safety reps who were on a course grabbed me, got a bit taken aback. And he said, Phil, it's fantastic. This is, I've been in, been in the industry 30-odd years. This is the first time we've ever bought anybody else. I've been sold three times, but I love the journey we're going on. And for me, you know, the, the fact that two guys could stop the CEO in Union Street as his head's in the clouds, grab me and say thank you, was, was tremendous. But I'd look to use that conduit. You can build tremendous goodwill and have eyes and ears and direct lines. I have people email me from offshore, as Bob knows, and tell me things that are going on, and, and, and that's not going around people's backs. You have to encourage people to go through the normal chains, but why not, whether, whether, it, whether, whether it's good or bad? They're a great source of ideas. Right, how am I doing for time? I'm, I'm good. Chris finished early. Um, I'll finish it with some lead other leadership points. You know, we have to look out for weak signals. You know, people talk about a chronic sense of unease. I, I often, I, I can stand in front of a thousand people, but to stand up in front of you guys and talk about safety makes me feel nervous and, que and queasy. You should feel that. You should, you should feel that chronic sense of unease. Yeah, we're as good as, we're as good as, we're as good as tomorrow. You know, you have to, as leaders, point out when people are doing the wrong thing. If somebody's sitting on the airplane even and not listening to the bloody safety video, even if it makes you cringe, if it's one of your crew, you've got to point it out because then the techs at the back or sitting next to you will spot that your manager isn't watching the safety video and know they don't actually give a damn. They could probably recite it off by heart, but it's important to show the rest of the world that, is, that, it, that it's important because everybody else on the plane doesn't, doesn't know the words off by, off by heart. We have to react strongly. 
And Bob knows I sometimes we have to I have to sometimes react more strongly than I would normally do because people expect that. You have to react strongly when you see things wrong. Not irrationally, and maybe in parallel with Bob will we'll agree the good cop, bad cop routine, but you have, to re you have to react. Otherwise, people will know you don't really care and that they don't need to bother either. Now, one last thing I've given you, some homework with the two HSC booklets. The other thing that would be interesting for you all to do, and I've got one in my back pocket. Mark is not uh, our HSEQ director, always carries things in his back pocket. That's a little copy of our CMAP. Now, I'd actually, I don't know when the last time was you read your CMAP, particularly if you're, if you're one of the leaders of the company. But I'd go back and I, I'd have another read of it and see what it says that you're doing particularly on the touchy-feely stuff when you've read Chris's HSC guidance. See, holding a mirror up to yourself, whether you really are living up to some of those ideals and some of those things that you wrote down, whether you, whether you are really doing. You know, this is the organisation's collective thoughts and responsibilities. So that's my last piece of homework and last piece of advice. I say keep learning, keep talking, keep leading, we have to show the way and never give up. And as I said, uh, cock of the walk one week, feather dust to the next, or as only as good as tomorrow. Thank you.